This is a love story. A love story told across three decades and two continents against a backdrop of war and revolution. It's a story of boy meets girl, boy marries girl, and together, boy and girl preside over one of the most significant and bloodiest periods of modern history. Nicholas and Alexander were catastrophic rulers. Whatever else one could ever say about her, she loved Nicholas and always loved him. Theirs was a romance that influenced the fall of a 300-year-old empire and the reshaping of one-sixth of the globe. Two lovers who, through their intimate correspondence, caused the Earth, or at least its borders, to move beneath them. This is the epic love story of the last Russian Tsar and his Empress. But rather than living happily ever after, their love led only to their own violent death and the gruesome massacre of their young family. The shooting was absolute chaos. Blood and brains everywhere. This is a romantic fable that ends in bloodshed. It is the story of the obsessive relationship that destroyed an empire. This is Nicholas and Alexandra in their own words. Like many a modern day relationship, our two lovers met at a wedding, right here at the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. The 16-year-old Nicholas, who was attending his uncle's wedding, was introduced to the bride's little sister. She was just 12 years old, and her name was Alexandra. They were very taken with each other, and they met again at family occasions. And gradually, um, it became clear that Nicky was determined that he would marry this girl, come what may. They would have met anyway, you know, they were um, from that very, very narrow royal circle. Um, but it made it much easier for them to meet and even to spend some time together. Um, that they were then related by marriage and quite closely related. Pretty soon after meeting, we know that Nicholas wrote in his diary about how much he cared for her um, and how much how highly he thought of her. Uh, but they don't actually have an opportunity to talk engagement, etc. for a few years uh, later. My dream? One day to marry Alex H. I have loved her for a long time but more deeply and strongly since 1889, when she spent six weeks in Petersburg during the winter. For a long time, I resisted my feelings and tried to deceive myself about the impossibility of achieving my most cherished wish. Before Nicholas's dream could come true, he would first struggle for parental approval. He might have had his heart set on a German princess, but his father had other ideas. Part of the problem is that Alexander, of course, is German, and there were factions of the imperial family in Russia, including uh, Nicholas's own father, who were very fervently anti-German. The family was actually very against it for all sorts of reasons, because they thought he was too young, she was too English, she was too German, and for all these reasons, they just felt that it was an inappropriate marriage for the heir to the Russian throne. And they started to look for other candidates. The search began, but in the meantime, Alexander III thought the impressionable young Nicholas ought to have a little fun. He was a bit of a sort of 
bit of a nervous virgin, really. His father was beginning to think he was a bit of a girl's blouse, and so some of the family said it's time he met a ballerina. And the Imperial Ballet, which was actually run by the Romanov family as a personal institution of the monarch, was a sort of dating agency for Grand Dukes. And so the Tsar took his son to the graduation ceremony of the Imperial School of Theatrical Dance, where he introduced Nicholas to the 18-year-old Polish ballerina Matilde, affectionately known as Little K. They introduced Nicky deliberately with the, with the agreement of his father to Matilde Kaczynskiaia. And they began this really touching affair, actually. And so he had a wonderful time with this girl, and it was first love. It was a very sweet relationship, really. As a timid and gentle soul, with a genuine interest in music and the arts, Nicholas, now 22, was something of a hopeless romantic. It's said that he loved to watch the beautiful Matilde through his binoculars whenever she performed, which was often in stunning locations like this, the Mikulovsky Theater in St. Petersburg. The ballerina who captured the heart of the future emperor opened him up to a different world and to new experiences. He was swept up in all the passion and obsession that characterizes the first taste of a love affair. These dancers are demonstrating the sort of beautiful Russian technique that Nicholas would have seen little K, Mathilde doing. And we can see why he was so entranced. I have noticed something very strange within myself. I never thought that two similar feelings, two loves, could coexist at one time within one heart. I have already loved Alex H for three years and constantly hope to marry her one day, God willing. And since the camp of 1890 until now, I have been madly in love with little Kay. What a surprising thing our heart is, and at the same time, I never stop thinking about Alex. Though Nicholas would always hold Mathilde dear and would continue to watch her dance, it was somewhat inevitable that the curtain would fall on their romantic relationship because he was determined to marry Alexandra no matter what the obstacles. And there were many. And yet, as his diary entries attest to, Alexandra was never far from Nicholas's thoughts. At the start of the 20th century, the Russian and German empires occupied much of northern and eastern Europe. A marriage between the two nations was a serious business. But what concerned the Tsar more was that Alexandra, the German princess that his son Nicholas seemed insistent upon marrying, was the granddaughter of Queen Victoria, making her to all intents and purposes culturally English. She was really brought up as an Englishwoman, and much of her problem came from a sort of English froideur, a sort of chilly Englishness that was disastrous in Russia. Alexandra's childhood had been blighted by tragedy. She had lost her brother, a haemophiliac, when she was three years old. At the age of six, her five-year-old sister and her mother both died of diphtheria. Alexandra's mother died young and actually Queen Victoria then really took the girls under her wing. So Alexandra was a rather prissy Victorian English upper-class woman in many ways. Queen Victoria was an incredibly shrewd old bird and she recognised that though she absolutely loved her Alex, that she would be very ill-suited to marry into a difficult political environment and there was no more politically difficult environment than the court of Russia. Alexandra grew up to be a serious woman. 
who's inherited prudery and Victorian reserve made her seem antisocial in the wider European circles in which she was now moving. She was shy of strangers. She flushed horribly when nervous and she spoke in a whisper. She was also a fussy eater, had little interest in or instinct for fashion and she was reportedly a bad dancer. All things considered, Alexandra wasn't best placed to enjoy the social scene of the young, rich and powerful. And yet, despite all this, she was being courted by one of the most eligible bachelors in Europe. Darling Alex, just a wee line to send you my very best wishes on your birthday, which is in two days. I see Ella rather often, and we always speak about your stay in St. Petersburg. It seems to have been so long ago. Dearest Nikki, so many thanks for your dear letter, which gave me great pleasure. It was so kind of you to remember the old toad's birthday. The correspondence of their courtship set the tone for the rest of their relationship. They wrote to each other obsessively when apart. Often intimate, always personal, mundane details wreathed with ardent, passionate declarations. Some 1,700 of them survived from the course of their relationship, and they were written in English. Nicholas was multilingual, and Alexandra, on first meeting him, was yet to master Russian, and so English became their common language. Their use of English would become habitual, and it remained the language of their letters until they died. But love in these circumstances was not always enough. Alexandra's religion also proved to be an obstacle. One of the problems uh, for Nicholas and Alexandra when they were wanting to get engaged was uh, one of religion. So being a German princess, Alexandra was Lutheran, um, and uh, Nicholas, of course, was uh, Russian Orthodox. He was not only Russian Orthodox, he was, in fact, perceived by the Russian Orthodox Church as the great um, God-given autocrat. So if Alexandra was going to become the Empress of all the Russias, uh, then she needed to be Russian Orthodox as well. The wife of almost any Russian Grand Duke, but absolutely the wife of the heir to the throne, had to be Orthodox. So the price of marrying Nicholas was converting from Protestantism to Russian Orthodoxy. Dearest Nikki, I am certain that you would not wish me to change against my conviction. What happiness can come from a marriage which begins without the real blessing of God? For I feel it a sin to change that belief in which I have been brought up and which I love. It would be acting a lie to you, your religion and to God. After receiving this letter, Nicholas wrote in his diary, This morning, in a letter from Alex, I learnt that everything is over between us. It is impossible for her to change her religion, and all my hopes are shattered by this implacable obstacle, my best dreams and most cherished wishes for the future. This was a terrible, terrible obstacle, and she loved Nikki too, but she was an absolute believer that Alexandra was of a very religious temperament. She was mystical, she was religious, she went to church a lot, and she said she could not change her religion for anything. No change of religion, no marriage. Parental disapproval, religious differences, Alexandra wasn't an obvious choice for Empress. But in time, Alexandra acquiesced. Eventually, uh, she came to accept the fact that if she wanted to marry Nicholas, and that meant if she wanted to become the Tsarina eventually, then she was going to have to be Russian Orthodox, and she did eventually convert. 
Alexandra stays uh, very pious throughout her life uh, and religion plays a very big role um, in the way that she lives her life and in fact in her political role in Russia. In fact, Alexandra became even more orthodox than most, involving herself in the study of the mystical aspects of Russian orthodoxy. She was committed to Nicholas from the start, and when she finally agreed to convert, the Tsar too began to soften. Nicky could be very obstinate. Part of his character was a huge obstinacy, and he was determined. And in the end, he said to his, his terrifying father, look, um, it's either her or no one. So, in the end, his father said, OK, then, ask her. And he did. Nicholas and Alexandra became engaged in the spring of 1894. It was to become a turning point in the history of Russia. Nicholas's father, Tsar Alexander III, was a very different man to his son and heir. Alexander's nickname was the Colossus. Such was his stature. He was a big, strong, autocratic bear of a man. Nicholas, by contrast, was five foot seven, with narrow shoulders and short, stocky legs. Alexander shielded his son and heir from the rigors and responsibilities of being emperor. Nicholas was more than happy to receive this protection. It was a terrifying thing to be told you were heir to the Russian throne. Um, virtually everybody, even um, Nicholas II's giant father, had wept when they learned that they were the heir to the Russian throne because it was a terrifying poison chalice and everyone knew that. It was a mammoth undertaking to become Tsar and Alexander was, perhaps understandably, reticent to prepare his son for rule. Nicholas, the Tsarevich, the heir to the throne, was not allowed to join the Council of State until 1893. Alexander III didn't include him in enough government. He should have included him in more. To be Tsar of Russia was an extremely difficult job, even for the most able person. You really had to be a genius to be emperor of all the Russias. You had to be a field marshal, a prime minister, um, a patriarch, a family leader. Nicholas II was no genius. The Tsar had believed that time was on his side. He still had decades to live, plenty of time for Nicholas to learn slowly. He was wrong. The following year, Alexander III was dead. He was just 49. Alexander died from inflammation of the kidneys. Nicholas became Tsar immediately, although his coronation wasn't to happen for two years. First, he must marry. So he and Alexandra were wed with much pomp and ceremony here at the Grand Church at the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, just weeks after Nicholas's father's death. The passing of the Tsar, the immediate thrusting of Nicholas into Tsardom and his subsequent marriage meant that this was an incredibly difficult time, not only for Nicholas and for all of Russia, but also for Alexandra. It would certainly have been easier for her if she could have had quite a long period married to the heir. As it was, you know, they're dumped immediately on marriage into the business of being emperor and empress. She had to bury her new father-in-law and then get married about, you know, within two weeks of that. A real strain for this girl who was really um, not a tough person at all. She barely made it through the marriage. And yet, despite her perceived weakness, her later letters show that Alexandra was surprisingly strong, when it came to Nicholas at least, and regularly encouraged her husband to be tougher in affairs of state. It was a stance that would later prove to be their downfall. Love be firm. Show the master hand. It is what Russia needs. Love and kindness you have never failed to show. Now let them feel your fist at all times. They must learn to fear you. Love is not enough. 
A child that adores its father must still have fear to anger, displease or disobey him. As the granddaughter of Queen Victoria, Alexandra had seemingly inherited some of the British monarch's stubbornness. Nicholas, in turn, derived great strength from his new wife's convictions. The young Tsar believed in autocratic rule, but he lacked the mettle of a natural autocrat. Alexandra offered him a spine, giving him forcefulness where he had none. She also offered a kind of maternal protectiveness that he hadn't received from his own mother. His father ruled with an iron fist, a conservative backlash against the liberal reforming efforts of his own father, Alexander II. Alexander II had decided that modernization was essential. This was at the high point of the Victorian era, and he brought in a number of classically liberal reforms. I mean, he emancipated the serfs. He introduced a Western-style judicial system. He loosened the censorship, these kind of reforms. But these changes didn't please everyone, and in 1881, Nicholas's grandfather was brutally murdered. This is the uniform he was wearing on the day that he died. Alexander II was assassinated by uh, some revolutionaries who didn't like the way that he had dealt with the peasantry in Russia and who felt that there needed to be a revolution. Um, he's killed in his carriage in St. Petersburg uh, and as a result of this, uh, this brings a kind of end to a period of experimentation with liberal reforms in Russia. At the age of 13, Nicholas II had seen an unbearable and terrible sight. His grandfather had been blown to pieces by a terrorist bomb. He stood and watched as his grandfather died, one of his legs blown off, his face um, torn to pieces, his mistress howling um, as he died. And this gave him, from, from a young age, a sort of uh, fatalism that he carried with him his whole life. It gave him a suspicion of any concessions to liberal opinion. Consider the effect this must have had on the young Nicholas. On a personal level, he witnessed the horrific and bloody death of his beloved grandfather. On a political level, here was the direct consequence of what happened when emperors embraced democracy. Alexander II's reforms were rolled back in the wake of his assassination, and in the moment of his death, Nicholas's father immediately became emperor, making Nicholas himself the heir to the throne, the Tsarevich. The Russian monarchy was built on a foundation of exceptionalism, a belief that the ruling family did so under appointment by God. It was this sense of entitlement that drove autocratic rule. This belief in their own divine protection allowed Nicholas and Alexandra to withdraw from reality and revel in matters of the heart and of the flesh. I clasp you tenderly to my heart, kiss and caress you without end, meant to show you all the intense love I have for you, warm, cheer, console and strengthen you and make you sure of yourself. Sleep well, my sunshine, Russia's saviour. My own wifey dear, my warmest thanks for your letters. After opening the envelope, I put my nose in and breathe your scent. Nicholas and Alexandra wrote to each other a huge amount during this years, often more than once a day. My own darling, I kiss you over and over for your beloved letters. The two last ones smelt delicious of your scent, which even went through the envelope in the shape of a greasy spot. A lot of it was very much about their own, you know, personal relationship, about how much they missed each other. A lot of it was very flirty. It was certainly very affectionate. They always used pet names for each other. Some of it was sexual. 
Lovey, my soul, it's so lonely without your caresses, which mean everything to me. Ah, how me loves you. I kiss and caress every tenderly beloved place and gaze into your deep, sweet eyes, which long ago conquered me completely. They were obsessed with each other. If the letters show us anything, it's that they created their own world, lived by their own rules, and even spoke their own language. The letters are, are, are chock-a-block full with longing for each other. They're very romantic letters in a way. They really show how close their relationship was. So very fascinating, intimate stuff is in these letters. Their pet names even extended to her period, something Nicholas and Alexandra would refer to as Madame Becker. Nicholas, for his part, bought into his wife's unwavering belief, both in himself and in the future of the Romanov dynasty. That dynasty, however, needed an heir. In 1901, Nicholas and Alexandra had been married for six years. The imperial family had four daughters, but still no son. We know, of course, that Russia in the past had had empresses, Catherine the Great being the most recent one before Nicholas. However, after Catherine the Great, new rules were enacted which said that no woman could inherit the throne. As a result of this, Nicholas and Alexandra are under enormous pressure to have a boy as soon as they can. When Alexandra failed to produce a son again and again, she became desperate and turned to mysticism. It was believed that bathing in the spring of a saint could lead to the birth of a baby boy. Whatever the truth, something worked. Their only son, Alexei, was born here at Petergoff Palace in August 1904. This is the Prince Alexei. He's named after Nicholas's favorite Tsar, Alexei Mikhailovich from the 17th century. And there is much rejoicing at the fact that they have finally had a boy. Their delight overflowed, the excitement, but there was already something worrying about this boy. He was bleeding from his navel, and the bleeding went on and on. Now, they knew that there was something which they called the English disease, and the English disease was haemophilia. Alexandra, in her family, many people had already died or been infected with the haemophilia, the English disease, and she was aware that she could be a carrier, and it turned out that she was. Alexandra took the news of her son's haemophilia particularly hard. As a hereditary disease passed down by the mother, she felt directly responsible. As the shame built, so did the fear that Alexei's illness would eventually deprive him of the throne. So the decision was taken to keep it a secret from all but close family. Alexei's condition required near constant management and it frequently threatened the boy's life. Alexander would often become hysterical, obsessed with and all consumed by the illness. Baby was awfully cheery and gay all day till he went to bed. In the night he woke up from pain in his left arm and from two on scarcely got a moment's sleep. It's too despairing for words, poor little man. The pain came with such force in the night, and the arm won't bend, but perhaps God will mercifully make it pass. The family needed help, and help came in the most unexpected form. A drunk, promiscuous holy man named Father Grigori. History more often remembers Father Grigori by another name, Rasputin.
Here was a man that Alexandra believed could predict the future. He offered spiritual guidance, and most importantly of all, he promised he could save Alexei's life. Father Grigori was nothing but a peasant, a self-anointed healer. And the exact scale of his influence is much debated, but it is certain that he played a significant role in the problems beginning to engulf the Romanovs, problems that threatened the very foundations of the Russian Empire and hastened the impending revolution. Rasputin was a very typical type in the Orthodox Church, a peasant who discovered religion. He'd probably been a horse thief and seducer as a young boy. Um, he loved to drink, he loved women. Rasputin was a peasant from Western Siberia. He was a sort of orthodox wanderer. Um, he wasn't a monk, it's nonsense calling him a monk. He had no official position with the church, but there was a tradition in Russia of sort of so-called holy men going on pilgrimage, acquiring a sort of aura of not quite sanctity, but of piety. He was meant to be um, very charismatic. Um, he was someone who people, you know, um, alternately described as, you know, hideously ugly and terrible smelling and, you know, dirty. And at the same time, somehow as exerting this kind of, you know, intense charisma and power and authority um, when he spoke to people uh, and kind of authority over especially women. When he turns up um, uh, and sort of manages to weasel his way into the imperial family, he presents himself as just this simple, um, simple man from the countryside who, due to his, um, you know, complete lack of uh, sort of heirs or graces, actually has a, a you know, a closer link to God um, than anyone else. A power-hungry madman, a drug addict, a rapist, People accused Rasputin of being many things, but Alexandra believed that he could heal her sickly son. And so in her eyes, he could do no wrong. In 1913, Nicholas noted in his diary, In the evening, Alexei's elbow began to hurt. He could not sleep for a long time and was in great pain, poor thing. At seven o'clock, Grigory arrived and spent a short while with Alex and Alexei. Soon after his departure, the pain in Alexei's arm started to go away. He himself became calmer and began to fall asleep. The remarkable stories of Rasputin's ability to heal the sickly Zarevich have passed into legend. In 1912, Alexei seemed to be dying. Of that, the doctors were in no doubt. A blood infection had taken hold. But Rasputin, on this occasion, sent Alexandra a telegram stating, God has seen your tears and heard your prayers. Do not grieve. The little one will not die. Alexei recovered once more. Now, you can analyze this in many different ways. It really depends what your attitude is. Um, firstly, you can choose to believe that um, Rasputin was, in fact, a sacred healer who could, um, who could save the boy's life. Um, secondly, you can regard um, Rasputin as someone who could simply calm the hysterical mother, particularly, and the boy, but also the, the mother, um, who believed in him and trusted him, and that this calming of the mother actually calmed the boy and much of the bleeding would slow down. But either way, um, all that mattered in Russia was that two people believed in this, and those two people were Nicholas and Alexandra. Whether a placebo or a miracle, the heir to the Russian Empire was still alive, and Alexandra believed that Father Grigori was responsible. The Romanovs were now heavily in Rasputin's debt. Nicholas and Alexandra's belief in religious healing had been tested and in their eyes proved reliable. 
Their faith in democracy was far less robust. In 1905, Russia had been involved for more than a year in a costly war with Japan, and workers were striking because of their terrible labor conditions. A priest called Father Gapon would lead a huge march to present to the Tsar a petition um, for representative rule, a more broad-based government, not just an autocracy. Then they would present these wishes to the Tsar at the Winter Palace. The Tsar immediately made sure that he moved to Tsarsko Selo, his, one of his country estates, away from this trouble. And the military of officials decided that they would not allow these protesters to cross the bridges. And they set up um, machine gun nests and put, um, put, put Cossacks on horseback to stop them. Nicholas's absence meant that the protesters were met not by their Tsar, but by the gunfire of armed Cossacks. Hundreds of people were killed. The massacre became known in Russia as Bloody Sunday. Nikki and Alexandra were strangely removed from this tragedy. I mean, yes, they realized that they had screwed up in a big way, um, but they blamed other people. Um, they didn't think it was too serious. And anyway, ultimately, they believed that they were the sacred autocrats, and that was all that mattered. This disconnection between the luxurious lifestyle of the Romanovs and the pain and suffering of the peasantry was nothing new. In fact, it was a recurring theme. As far back as the couple's coronation, more than a thousand people had died in a stampede at Kordenka Field in Moscow as a result of the poor management of the coronation celebrations. Many were horrified that the emperor and empress didn't cancel their plans to attend a ball at the French embassy that same night. Though Nicholas did note the tragedy in his diary. The crowd broke through the barrier and there was a crush, during which, it was terrible to say, about 1,300 people were trampled. We dined with Mama at 8 o'clock and then went to the Montebello Ball. It was very magnificently done, but the heat was unbearable. There's this idea that the Tsar, although he is this figure that is um, close to God, so in many ways is you know, very far above the people, at the same time there's this idea of the kind of little father Tsar, that he is the person who most understands the pain and the suffering of the Russian people, of the Russian peasants, of the Russian worker. But what Nicholas has done, by ignoring what happened at Hedinka, seemingly, um, is he has, seems to suggest that he doesn't understand the pain and suffering of the Russian people, or perhaps even worse, that he doesn't care. A reign that begins with over a thousand people dying in a stampede at the coronation, people think that's not something that's going to go very well. And they were right. Years later, the massacre at the Winter Palace, the escalation from peaceful protest to violent bloodbath, ignited the touch paper that began the 1905 revolution. Anarchy spread across Russia and seeped into the army and the navy. The violent events of 1905 proved that the Romanovs could not ignore the clamor for democracy anymore. In that same year, as a direct result of the unrest, Nicholas signed a manifesto for the improvement of the state order here at Petergoff Palace. It promised basic civil rights and a parliament called the Duma. Nicholas had promised uh, a Duma, so Duma is the Russian word for parliament. So he essentially promised to turn his autocracy into a constitutional monarchy. Um, so he would still stay the all-powerful monarch, um, but some of those powers would be uh, rented out to a parliament, essentially, that would be elected by the people. He promises a parliament which will have control to some extent over budgets and which will also be a sounding board for public opinion. The regime's initial hope is that by granting a very generous, all-male, but nevertheless generous, uh, franchise, peasant conservatism will mean that uh, the Duma will be more friendly to the Tsar, to the monarchy. It was a step towards democracy.
but it wasn't enough. It became clear that um, part of the deal with the Duma would be that Nicholas could veto any legislation that they passed. So while on the one hand you have this legislative body, um, which is something that at a kind of all empire level Russia has never had before in quite the same way, not certainly not an elected one. Um, by the same token, if Nicholas has veto over legislation, then you can see that maybe the power isn't necessarily in the Duma's hands quite so much. Surely there is some way in which a woman can be of help and use. I do so yearn to make it easier for you. And the ministers all squabbling amongst each other at a time when all ought to work together. It makes me rage. If you could only be severe, my love, it is so necessary. I cover your sweet face with endless tender kisses. Love you beyond words, my own very own sunshine and joy. The social unrest that had begun in 1905 had been caused by a sense that the Romanovs failed to act decisively in times of crisis. This created a feeling that they cared little for the plight of the everyday Russian. They neither understood nor listened to them. The Duma was a parliament created to give the people a voice. It lasted three months. One Duma after another was created, and each one proved rebellious and difficult to manipulate. Very quickly, um, Nicholas discovered that the, you know, the, the, the elected members of the Duma, the M MPs if you like, um, were extremely leftist, not to say socialist. And so he dissolved one parliament, then another parliament, then another parliament, and kept tightening the rules to try and claw back more power to himself as autocrat and also to fill the, the Duma with trustworthy, right-wing, conservative loyalists. But yet again, the letters show us that Nicholas and Alexandra chose to either dismiss or ignore these legitimate threats to their power. My own darling wifey, as soon as the Duma has gone away, I will send for the ministers. They continue coming nearly every day, and that takes all my time up. I go to bed after 1.30 a.m. normally, having to make haste on my writing, reading and receiving. Simply desperate. The most striking thing about 1905 is how Nicholas, in particular, failed to learn the lessons of that first revolution. The people wanted a voice. When they thought they had been given one via the Duma, their protests subsided. Yet the Tsar misread these signals, thinking that force had quelled the revolution. In dismissing the Duma, he only highlighted how little he understood his own empire. The ballot box could have saved Nicholas, his dynasty and his young family. Nicholas chose the bullet. By 1914, Nicholas was facing a greater challenge than his father or indeed any Romanov in 300 years of rule had ever experienced. He would soon be forced to battle riots on the streets of Petrograd. To fight the threat of Rasputin ending his rule. And to take on the advancing German army in one of the worst wars of the 20th century. The Russian emperor and his wife were playing directly into the hands of those who wanted them deposed, providing the revolutionaries with ammunition that would later be used to assassinate them and their children. In less than four short years, it would all be over. My brain feels rested here. No ministers and no fidgety questions to think over. I think it does me good, but only the brain. My heart suffers from being separated, and this separation I hate. During such times especially. I won't be long away, only to put all things as much as possible to rights here, and then my duty will be done. In 1915, Nicholas made a fateful decision. 
Leaving his family behind, he traveled hundreds of miles to the Eastern Front. The Tsar was taking command of the armed forces. Nicholas was going to war.